here at Life Point Church last Sunday of August. Can you believe it? The year, yeah, it's crazy. The year is going by really, really fast. Thanks, Roll. So we are thankful that you came out today. In your packet, there's some notes, so I want you to pull those out. Uh, we're actually in a series called The Heart of Life Point Church. We've got this message and next Sunday's message, and we will be finishing up this series. Now, I don't know if you're in anybody into football in our crowd today. Anybody into football? Come on, let's see your hand. Okay, are you? All right, yeah. Well, this week was like the tale of two quarterbacks. Two quarterbacks really made the news this week. One is our own Tony Romo, right? Played his first game, already injured, going to miss the bulk of the season, six to ten weeks. That's still iffy. And uh, so we all saw that hit, saw that fall, heard about a broken bone in his back. So, I mean, that's sad, okay? He got injured, and uh, it's a sad thing. It really is, not only for him, but for the Cowboys. Who knows what the season's going to be like. Now, the other guy that made the news is a guy uh, named Colin Kaepernick, quarterback of the San Francisco 49ers. Some of you know this guy, okay? Uh, he's kind of a... You know, kind of in a sad situation because he only makes about, you know, $12 million a year. So, I mean, kind of a sad situation. But what Colin Kaepernick made news for this week is because when they were playing the Seattle Seahawks, he refused to stand and give honor to America during the national anthem. And ever since that demonstration, which he said was a protest, he's gotten a lot of feedback. Okay. In fact, here's what he tweeted, just so you know. I'm not going to stand up to show pride and a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. That was just the first part of the tweet. Now listen, when you are making $12 million a year, you're not oppressed, right? It's so interesting because of Colin Kaepernick's background, in case you didn't know this story, and there's a reason why I'm telling you this, uh, he was born in 1987 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. His mother, Heidi Russo, was a 19-year-old woman, single, in poverty. Uh, the father of the baby left before the baby was even born. He was an African-American man. And when Colin Kaepernick was a baby, he was adopted into a white family. And his two parents white parents with two other children, white children, took Colin into their home and gave him a great home, gave him every opportunity available. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is I'm not saying that as a put down. I'm saying that to be instructive because, guys, you know us at LifePoint Church, this is not a political statement. This is not a racial statement. There's nothing about it. We believe all lives matter at this church. It doesn't matter what color you are, okay? Red, black, brown, yellow, purple, polka dot, it doesn't matter, whoever you are, okay? There's nothing to do with that in this story, okay? The reason why this story grabbed my attention and grabbed the country's attention is because he is protesting something that he is a part of, okay? He's a part of a country that gave him incredible opportunities, and yet he's protesting against it. I'm here today to tell you this, and I wrote it down. Kyle Kaepernick is protesting the very country that made him what he is. America is an imperfect nation. We have an imperfect history. But it is still, in spite of its flaws, the greatest nation on earth. Everyone in America, on their worst day, is better off and more blessed than 95% of the people on this planet. I really believe that. You know, on your worst day, going through your worst situation, you still have it better than 95% of the people on this planet. Even the people in our country that are, that are poor people, compared to other countries, they're rich. And so what the point of this, you're thinking, okay, well, what does this have to do with the Heart of Life Point Church? Here it is. People who take Copernic's approach to church and protest what is wrong in church and not focus on what is right in church are doing the church and themselves and the people that aren't Christians a disservice. And there are a lot of people 
who protest the church because they say, well, the church is full of hypocrites, the church has problems, the church isn't meeting my needs, or whatever the if is. We protest. How do we protest in church? By not coming. How do we protest in church? By not serving. How do we protest in church? By not giving. How do we protest in church? By not staying and going somewhere else. That's how we protest in church. And what I believe is the secret ingredient of making strong and healthy churches is when all of us collectively say, hey, we know the church is a mess because we're a mess. We know the church is imperfect because we're imperfect. We know the church has flaws because we have flaws. And we're going to work to make it better. We're going to do what we can to make it stronger and healthier. Okay? And so I really believe that's the approach we need to take with church. Now, you know, I've been in the ministry a long time. And I've, I've had a lot of opportunities to talk to people that have a lot of problems. And a lot of times people feel like if they've got a lot of problems, all they have to do is change their location or change their situation or change their geography, and all of their problems are going to be solved. If you're having problems in a relationship, the secret is not getting a new relationship. The secret is fixing the one you're in. If you've got a problem in a job, unless it's totally oppressive and, and something you just can't live with, but if you've got problems on your job, it's not necessarily changing the job that's going to fix it. It may be changing you. And the same goes for church. You know, churches are full of problems. Why? Because they're full of people. And why? Because people are full of problems. So churches are full of problems, right? And the answer is not finding a new church that's going to solve the problems because, you know, I learned something a long time ago. Whatever issues I have in my life, wherever I go, I take them with me. I take them with me. And it's surprising that we think a new location, a new relationship, a new geography, a new church is going to solve all the issues. But the problem is we're taking ourselves along for the ride. And so we've got to learn how to fix what's wrong and how to make it better without necessarily thinking, I'm not coming, I'm not giving, I'm not serving, I'm not staying, whatever it is. Do I agree with what Colin Kaepernick did? Absolutely not. Because this is the very country that gave him the freedom to be able to make $12 million a year or more and be able to do what he does. And do I believe that people who don't come, don't give, don't serve, don't stay, I don't agree with that because I think you need to find a church, plant roots, plug in, and work to make everything better. Do you know I've been a Christian since 1971? That's a long time. 45 years this month. And in that time, I wrote it down. Again, preparing for the message, here it is. In that time, I have been a part of seven churches. In 45 years, seven churches. And, you know, I think that that is something that's really, really significant. Because, guys, here's the thing. I love you. I'm going to tell you the truth. A lot of people change churches like they change their socks. Okay? You, need, you will never find a church that you are going to really have a significant part of unless you're willing to put down roots unless you're willing to stick with it over the long haul. And so the whole point of this message is that I want to tell you I love the church. Have you heard me say that during this series? I love the church, and I think the church is the most incredible thing. And not only do I love the concept of church, I love this particular church. And I'm asking you, and I'm challenging you, and I'm giving you a mandate that you should love your church, that you should just love it. And you should just dig it, and you should enjoy it, and you should want other people to be a part of it with you. You ought to say, man, I'm going to church. I want you to come along. It's the coolest thing that's going to happen to me this week. You know, I really think that that's how we ought to view church. It ought to be the highlight of our week, okay? Not something we feel like we've got to do. So we're going to talk today about the heart of LifePoint Church. Now, let me just do a little bit of review with you, okay, real fast. Because I want to give you some new information, what I'm calling the life point statements. But I think it's important to remember where we've been. Now, last week I gave you two passages that are foundational to this series. They're both in Habakkuk, and they're the same verse in two different translations. It says, write down this vision. In other words, God wants you to know everything that you need to know about the church, and you need to commit it to your memory, write it down, clearly inscribe it on tablets so that one may easily read it. Same verse, look at it, Habakkuk 2.2, 2. it's in your notes. The Lord said to me, Habakkuk, write my answer, write my vision, write my dream on a billboard, large and clear, so that anyone can read it at a glance and rush to tell others. Guys, the reason why I'm doing this five-part series 
is because I want our vision to be simple and shareable. I want you to understand it, and I want you to be able to tell it to other people in a way that they can understand it. We need to make our vision for our church something that is simple and something that is shareable. That's biblical right there, okay? So what I've done is I have talked about some concepts that I want you to really get in your head. Don't lose me here, okay? And I want to give you some visual symbols for that. There are five visual symbols I want you to memorize and I want you to understand to go along with this series. Number one is the symbol of an umbrella. An umbrella represents our overarching purpose, okay? Everything we do at LifePoint Church comes under the umbrella of purpose. And we've said before that our purpose is this, that we're going to be a church that has a great commitment to the great commandments and the great commission, and we will build a great church. Everybody should have that memorized. Light Point Church has a great commitment to the great commandments and the great commission, and that builds a great church, okay? Great commandments, love God, love others, great commission, go and tell the world about Jesus. When you love God, love others, and go tell everybody about it, that is what church is about. That is our umbrella. Everybody got umbrella in your mind, okay? Everybody got the umbrella. Everything we do falls under the umbrella of our purpose. Now, the second visual symbol I gave is a compass, Compasses aren't really in vogue anymore. Why? Because we have a phone that has a GPS system, right? So we don't use compasses the way that they used to use compasses. But how did they navigate before they had a GPS system? Well, they used a compass to give them direction, okay? And so what a compass does is a compass gives direction, all right? A compass helps you to know which way to go. What is our compass? It is our mission, okay? Our mission. Anybody remember our very short, very succinct mission statement that we've used and we've talked about? To point common people to an uncommon life in Jesus. That is the direction of our church. That is where we're headed. That is where we're going, okay? That directs everything we do, just like that compass, just like that GPS. Everything we do is about that direction, to point, that's what a compass does, right? To point common people, that's all of us, just regular ordinary people, to uncommon life in Jesus. Now, every life pointer ought to memorize that. Every life pointer ought to know that's our compass, that's our mission, that's where we're headed, okay? The third visual symbol are goalposts. We're in football season. Some of our students have already played their first football game. Pro football is headed out. TCU plays their first game this weekend, you Horn Frog fans. It's going to be a great fall, right? Okay, how do you know if you're doing good in football? You make a goal, touchdown, whatever it is. Thank you. You, you, you score. You, you go past the, the goal line, the goal post, the uprights. That represents vision because that tells us how we're doing with our purpose that tells us how we're doing with our mission. Okay, it is measurable. So how do we do that? Okay, here it is. We bring people to membership in God's family. That's one criteria. We develop them in Christ-like maturity. That's measurable. We see people growing in Christ. We equip them for their ministry in the church. That's a third criteria. We equip them for their life mission in the world. That's a fourth criteria. And we do it all in order to magnify God's name. That's the fifth criteria. In fact, the five purposes of the church. And so that is our measurable, tangible way we can say, okay, how are we making progress as a church? How are we fulfilling our umbrella purpose? How are we doing with our, our mission? How are we doing in that direction? And then the thing we talked about last week is our foundation or foundations, okay? I love this picture. It is of a lighthouse, and look at the foundation that is built on. It is built on a massive, solid, immovable rock. I love that. Guys, our church must be built on a solid foundation. And we gave what those six things are that comprise the foundation of the church last week. Okay, if you were here, you remember. We're a church that is Christ centered, we're a church that is Bible based. We're a church that is God-honoring, God-glorifying. 
We're a church that is spirit-led. We're a church that is prayer-powered. And we're a church that is mission-minded. Those six components are the bedrock of everything we do. Okay? So undergirding the umbrella purpose, undergirding the compass direction and mission, undergirding our vision is these intangible, biblical, foundational elements that make us a New Testament church. Because, guys, a church cannot be a New Testament church without those six things. If you're in a church that doesn't have those six things as foundational elements, that is not a biblical New Testament church. And now, today, you're saying, well, it's about time you get to something new. Now, today, we're going to use the fifth visual symbol, and that is DNA. DNA is at the core of every human being. DNA is at that, that, that cellular level, that cellular level that makes us who we are. Every person in this room is defined by your DNA. Why do you look like you do? Your DNA. Why do you have your hair color? Your DNA. Why do you have your skin color? Your DNA. Why do you have your bone structure? Your DNA. Why do you have your innate gifts and talents and abilities? Your DNA. Why do you have your eye color? Your DNA. Why do you have the voice you have? Your DNA. Everything about you that makes you who you are is ultimately defined by the DNA that you were given at birth. When that cell from your father and that cell from your mother came together and created you, at a DNA level, you were defined by that. Okay? Now, we certainly can do things to alter our appearance, but you can't alter your DNA. Okay? Who you are at a cellular level never, ever changes, okay? And so what is the DNA of LifePoint Church? What is it about us? What are our values that makes us who we are? Okay, that's what we're going to answer in the time that I have remaining. It says in our notes, recognizing God's call on each church to impact the world. We also recognize that like a puzzle piece, each church takes on a different shape as it seeks to live out that calling. Now listen, there are some great churches within five minutes of this church, okay? And I know most of the guys that are past there. Don Womble down at Fountains Fellowship, great guy, great church, okay? Okay, and you've got uh, Jeff Wickwire over at Turning Point, another great guy. Known the guy for years, okay? We've got other churches in the area. Every church you go to that is a biblical Jew church, there's a uniqueness to it. That's what their DNA is about, okay? The following values are the DNA of LifePoint Church, and they form the culture and context of our church, the LifePoint Statements. Now, I want you to write these down. They're not going to be real profound, but they're going to have a lot of implications, okay? Some of them are very obvious, so we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about them, but you need to know what is the DNA of your church, you need to know what values we hold dear at this church. And there are actually, okay, actually 10 of them. And they form the word life point. Help you to remember it. Okay, write it down. The L, love and action. Guys, the most fundamental part of the core DNA of this church is we want to be a church that shows love in action. God's love and our love for people in action. That means that we are having practical, tangible, continual ways to pay it forward in our life and ministry. Guys, do you know that the most important thing we as a church can do is love people? If you love people, you are doing what God wants you to do. In fact, look at what it says in the Bible, 1 John chapter 3. This is how we know what love is. Do you know that I believe the most fundamental need of people that don't know Jesus is to find out what true love really is? This is how we know what love is. Christ gave his life for us. That defines love. We, too, then, ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. In the context of really impacting the world, love starts here with us. I mean, come on, if we can't love each other and we can't get along with each other and we can't live out love here, how are we expecting to reach the world? 
In fact, Jesus said, by this will all people know that you're truly my disciples if you have love one for another. Love is our greatest magnet. If we have possessions and see others in need, yet close our hearts against them, how can we claim that we love God? Our love must not just be words, hey, I love you, and talk, hey, pray for you. It must be true love, which shows itself in what? Action. Shows itself in what? Okay, that's why our first value is love and action. We got to be a loving church. And we got to be a church that doesn't just talk about love, we got to be a church that does love. Okay, the I. One of the values here, and again, we are kind of doing a reboot, so to speak, this fall. We're kind of getting back to some of the things that kind of launched us and we've kind of gotten a little bit away from. We're going to try to do a reboot. But one of the things that we've always believed in around here is that we need to provide intentional pathways to growth. Okay? Somebody has a clear, concise, defined strategy how they can grow in their faith. And we use, we've borrowed it from Saddleback Church in California. Many churches in America use this model. But it is a baseball diamond. Some of you love the Rangers. Some of you love baseball. That's great. But the goal of baseball is to get from first base to second base to third base and get to home plate and get a home run. That is the goal in baseball. That's how you know if you're doing good. Okay? So you hit a single, a double, a triple. You get in. You get a home run. That is the incremental way you score. That is the intentional pathway for growth around here. We have our Life Connect One, which is our membership class. In fact, if you have never joined this church officially and you want to join this church, we are going to have in September our Life Connect One class. But that's not all. We have Life Connect Two, which is helping you develop spiritual habits of maturity. How do you grow in the faith for yourself? How do you do it on your own so that you don't need Pastor Chuck and you don't need a life group leader, that you can actually learn how you can grow in your faith on your own? That's what Life Connect Two is. We're going to have that coming up at the end of September, first part of October. Then Life Connect 3, which is our class to help you to learn how to use your spiritual gifts in ministry. In fact, I was talking to somebody earlier this morning, and she said that Life Connect 3 was her favorite class at LifePoint because that's the one that really energized her for ministry. So we're going to show you how you can use your spiritual gifts, learn what they are, and minister. That's coming up within probably a month or two. And then our Life Connect 4 class, which is going to be our brand new missions class. It's going to be launched this fall. And so you're going to have a chance, guys, because we've kind of dropped the ball on this. We're picking it up. We're going to run with it. You're going to have a chance incrementally to go through the steps because I guarantee you when you get to Life Connect 4 and you learn what your life mission is and how you can share your faith in the world, you are going to be a mature believer. Okay? Intentional pathways to growth. In fact, look what the Bible says. The Bible says about it. Let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on toward maturity. That is progress. That is process. Circle the words go on. That is progress. That is process. You've got to have an intentional pathway. And then it says in Proverbs 4.26, mark out a straight path. Then stick to that path. The problem that we've had, God's being really honest, and the problem other churches have is we don't have a clearly defined, incremental, intentional process, strategy, and structure for growth, and sometimes people flounder in their faith. We're going to change that. We're going to help you to have an intentional pathway. Okay, let's move on. The letter F, write it down, life point, is faith-focused. Guys, you know what? This church has been built on faith. There was no way that a young church less than two years old could buy a campus like this without faith. Okay? Some of you know the story. We started this church, first service, the last Sunday of February 2009, met for almost two years at Fort Worth Academy. Every week, we had a team go in and set up, take down. And yet, by faith, we knew that God was in it. And then we had an opportunity to buy this building. And we walked into this building. We signed the papers for this building on December 23rd, 2010. And when we signed those papers, we owned this church completely. No mortgage. We bought it for cash. You know how we did that with a less than two-year-old church? There was faith involved, sacrifice involved. Okay? 
And so you've got to have faith, and that is the focus. In fact, we need to be about this, what I call OGCTD goals. In case you don't know what that means, it means that we need to have some things going on over here that can only be explained by only God can do that. If we can do everything ourselves, why do we need faith? If we can do everything our own, why do we need God? That's why we've got to stretch and believe for bigger things than we do. Can I tell you what is, guys, I'm just sharing my heart about myself. Sometimes I get in a ho-hum mindset. You know what that is? Ho-hum, big deal, so what? And I don't expect much, and I don't believe for much, and I don't really do much. But the times when I have the greatest spiritual adventures are the times that I really step out in faith and do something so impossible, so incredible, so unbelievable, that it can only be explained by God. How many times do we do that as a church? How many times are we telling to take that big of a risk? You know what it says in Hebrews chapter 1? What is faith? It is the confident assurance that something we want is going to happen. Look at it. What is faith? Certainty that what we hope for is waiting for us, even though we can't see it up ahead. What is faith? It is, it is believing only God can do certain things and trusting him. In fact, it says in verse 6, you can never please God without faith, without depending on him. How much are we really depending on God for at this church? How much are we really believing God for something so big, so huge, so unbelievable that he has to come through or we're going to fail. That's what faith is, okay? The letter E in life point. This is one of our values, empowered members. Guys, this is not a one-man show. This is our church together being empowered. Every one of you guys has something to do. And we believe that the ministry of this church is in the hands of everybody. Empowered members. Guys, I believe so much in all of you because everything that happens in this church happens because of you. It has nothing to do with me. It has to do with your faithfulness, your sacrifice, your giving, your serving, your inviting. Everybody's got a job to do. And I want you, from this moment on, from August 28, 2016, I want you to feel empowered to do ministry. I want you to feel empowered and gifted and fulfilled to do ministry. You know, I've, I believe that when you are empowered and you're filled with the Spirit and you are doing what God's called you to do and you have a passion for it, there's nothing like that. It brings so much fulfillment. Look at what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. They struggled with this. They struggled with this because they thought some people were really the important people in church and some people were like the peons in church. Have you ever felt that way? Like there are some people who are like the big wigs and then there's the rest of us. And you know what Paul did to set everybody straight? Look what he wrote. The hand can, or the eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. Okay? Man, I can see a lot, but I can't pick up anything. If I don't have my hand, I'm in trouble. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Yeah, can you see a big head not moving anywhere because there's no, no feet to carry it any place? In fact, some of the parts that seem least important are the most necessary. Think about that. Keep reading. All of you together. All of us together. Okay? Let's say it out loud. All of us together are Christ's body. And each one of you, okay? All of us collectively, but then each one of you, Lee and Monty and Albert, Cecilia, Pat, I go through naming names, each one of you is a necessary, separate and necessary part of it, okay? That's why we need empowered members. Because if I'm standing here, how can I change a diaper and angel point? And if I'm standing here, how can I be teaching children and kids point? And if I'm standing here, how can I be greeting and showing hospitality out there, okay? Everybody is important to the church. If you are not in a ministry, this is the time to say, I'm going to be an empowered member. And we're going to help you this fall, an intentional pathway to get you involved in ministry. What is the P? The P, one of the values here, is Life Point Church is a place to start over. Who knows our unofficial motto? The second chance grace place. Guys, we want to be a church of second chances. We want to be a church where somebody's been beat up, messed up. 
where they've made stupid choices, where their life is a wreck. We want to be a place where they can start over. We want to be the second chance grace place. And that is biblical because Paul, Jesus said this in Luke chapter 5. I'm here inviting outsiders, not insiders. In other words, I'm here for all the messy, messed up people of the world, not the inside religious do-gooders. I'm here for those people outside, and I'm giving them an invitation. What does it say? To a changed life. Change inside and out. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if Jesus offers that kind of life, then what should Life Point be? Life Point should be a place that Paul describes where we warmly welcome each other into the church. Just as Christ has warmly welcomed you, then God is going to be honored. Listen, everybody is welcome in this church. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what they've done. It doesn't matter what their lifestyle is. Everybody is welcome to come to this church. Now, does God want them to stay where they are if their life's a mess? Of course not. He wants to change them. He wants to transform them. But our job is to warmly welcome them. It's the Spirit of God's job to do a transformation inside. We've got to be a church that is a place to start over. That's one of our values. Look at the letter O. The letter O is ongoing discipleship. That means that we are going to go deeper and we are going to grow stronger. I want you to memorize that in your mind. We're a church that wants to take people deeper so that they can grow stronger. In fact, the whole chapter of Ephesians 4 is devoted to the church. If you go home today, I want you to read Ephesians 4. It's a great chapter. And in that chapter, Paul describes the church. And in verses 15 and 16, look what he says. God wants us to what? Grow up. You know, some of you just need to grow up in the Lord. You've been a baby too long. You've been in spiritual pampers too long. Okay, you've been taking formula too long. God's saying, listen, grow up. That's ongoing discipleship. Okay? To know the whole truth. How do you do it? You get in the Word. You get in a prayer life. To know the whole truth and tell it in love, like Christ in everything. We take our lead from Christ, who is the source of everything we do. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy in God, robust in love. Going deeper, growing stronger. Ongoing discipleship. That's why we have other ministries besides the intentional pathways to growth. That's why we have something called LG, Life Groups. Guys, if you come to Life Point and you come on Sundays and you don't get in a life group, you are missing the best part of this church. And you are missing an opportunity to grow in your faith and deepen your roots. You're missing an opportunity to go deeper and grow stronger. And guys, if you think I've been on your back about life group, I'm going to be on your back about life group this fall because it is so important. And I'm going to love you enough to give you a kick in the butt and say, you need to get in a life group. And we are just finishing up a great study by John Ortberg. But we are getting ready to start, I'm going to give you a little flavor a preview, we're getting ready to start a great new life group study right after Labor Day called the Miracle of Mercy, and it is going to rock your world. If you're not in a life group, you need to get a life group. Because that's where you're going to have ongoing discipleship. What else do we have? We have LOL, Ladies of Life Point, which is our women's ministry to connect women to each other in God and deepen their faith. In fact, they meet this Saturday at 11 o'clock. And we also have Momentum the men's ministry of Life Point Church, every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and we are doing discipleship at Momentum to help you deepen your faith. That's because we believe ongoing discipleship is a value in this church. The letter I, innovative outreach. We need to develop a whatever-it-takes mindset. We need to sit down. We need to decide, what is it going to take to reach this community? What is it going to take for us to make inroads in this community? We need to have a way to say, Lord, whatever it takes... Short of sin, we're going to do it. We're going to use any means, any opportunity, anything that we can use to reach people for Christ. We've got to have a whatever-it-takes mindset. We've got to think about innovative outreach, okay? You know what is so cool? I just have to say this. I just have to say, well, I was going to say it and she walked out of the room. I was going to talk about Brandy Young. I'll wait until she gets back. But some of you know the story about Brandy. Brandy posted this really cool thing to her students about her new homework policy. Do some of you know what I'm talking about here? Where she teaches second grade, 
And she did a lot of research this summer, and I really applaud that because I'm a former educator, and I really applaud a teacher that's trying to learn and grow. And she found for, for, for younger children, now this is not necessarily true for middle school, high school, but for younger children, homework is actually counterproductive. It really is. And so she instituted a policy where she is only going to assign homework that is left over from the daily lessons. If a child didn't complete it, they can complete it at home. But she's not giving extra work. And if you know the story, that post was posted on social media by one of the moms in the class, and it literally went viral. I mean, have you ever heard of something going viral? This went literally worldwide. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing how God has used it. How many, how many shares has she had? 100,000 shares of this, of this thing. This is amazing. She's been on so many newscasts, I can't even, I can't even count the time. She's been interviewed. I mean, I try to follow it, but I mean, she's just like, somebody said, I, I, I read this about your wife, somebody said that she is the most famous second grade teacher in the world right now. That's pretty cool. I mean, that's a pretty cool thing. You're the most famous second grade teacher in the whole world. That's amazing. Okay, guys, we need to have a commitment to going viral with the message of Jesus through life. We need to have a commitment to using innovative means and methods, do whatever it takes so that we can reach people for Christ. Guys, we are here to reach people for Christ. And listen, we're not doing the best job of it. We need to do better. You know, I love what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at what Paul says. Paul says, I became a servant to everyone so that I can say it out loud. Win them to Christ. Whatever a person's like, I try to find common ground with them so that he will let them, he will let me tell him about Christ and let Christ save him. Paul said, I do this to get the good news to them, and I do this for the blessing I receive when I see them come to Christ. Guys, you want to get blessed, you start helping people find Jesus. You want to get blessed when this church is poised and positioned and we're using innovative outreach, whatever it takes, whatever it takes for kids, whatever it takes for students, whatever it takes for adults, whatever kind of programming, whatever kind of events, whatever kind of tools, whatever kind of methods, whatever we do to be innovative. Because let me tell you something. What worked in the 50s doesn't work now. What worked in the 60s doesn't work now. What worked in the 70s when I met Jesus doesn't work now. What, met ten, what worked 10 years ago doesn't work now. Who would have thought 10 years ago that we would have the connection on social media we have? Okay? Brandy, while you were gone, I told everybody how great you were. You missed it. <laughs> I Let's give it for Brandy. Come on, that's amazing right there. At the pivotal moment of my message when I wanted to talk about you, you left. No. I was telling everybody about how, how the cool thing with the viral and, and the homework thing and, you know, how God, your husband said over 100,000 shares at this point. And you know what's funny? And don't be embarrassed. I think God gave you that platform. I think God raised you up for this purpose. But you know what? I said that I read an article about you and somebody said in the article, you're the most, second, the most famous second grade teacher in the whole world right now. That's pretty cool. Okay. So, yeah, let's, that's, I want to honor you. That's really awesome. Your church family's proud of you. But listen, we need to get excited about sharing Jesus and finding ways to do it. And I don't know every way to do it. Maybe you know some ways that are going to work that I don't know. Let's talk about it. Let's brainstorm. Let's find ways to be innovative. Okay? That's why I'm so appreciative to, to Reese and, and to his vision to take our services live. Do you know that Reese Joyner, one of our students, adults, you ought to feel ashamed of this a little bit. One of our students took the lead in one of our most important ministries we're doing right now, that we are now streaming our services live all around the world. Right now, what you are hearing, people anywhere in the world can go to a link and hear this service in any place in the world that has internet connection. Who would have thought 10 years ago you could have that kind of outreach? That's innovative outreach. And I applaud somebody that's got a dream. If you have a dream for how we can reach people, let's talk about it and do it. Okay? So, we do it all to share the good news. Here's the letter N. Next generation commitment. I'm glad that I mentioned Reese at this point. Because, guys, this is a church committed to the next generation. This is a church that wants to do the best we can do with our kids and with our students. And we have a next generation commitment. And it's not just for the future, it's for right now. Do you know that I think some of the strongest ministries in our church are those that have our kids and our students involved in? 
I don't want to say, well, listen to our children. Listen, when you get to be an adult, we're going to let you serve Jesus. Or our students, listen, when you graduate from high school and go to college and get out of college and you're an adult, you know, you can serve. Listen, serve Jesus now, and we're having a commitment to partner with our children. And let me tell you something. I've got to brag on our team. Clay, who leads our angel point. Melora, who's here, that leads our kids point. They do an amazing job. We've got to give it up for these people. They do an amazing job. <laughs> Pastor Chris and Pastor Brian, who lead our students. They do an amazing job, I tell you. <laughs> Guys, we have in this church from the very beginning a commitment to children and to students and to helping them. And why is that? Because it's biblical. That is a value. That's in our DNA. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. Be careful. Don't make the mistake of thinking that little children are unimportant. Do you love that? Don't make the mistake because here's what the disciples wanted to do. They wanted Jesus for adults only. If you know the story, it's true. There's all these kids wanting to be with Jesus, and the disciples are like being the bodyguards at the door. They're kind of pushing them aside. Listen, we want the, the important people. We want the grown-ups around Jesus. And Jesus took the children, not only around him, it says he took them in his arms, and he hugged them, and he held them, and he was demonstrating that the next generation is on the heart of God. And we've got to be a church like that. We are and we will continue to be. The letter T, the letter T means together is better. Guys, I said earlier, we need to be a church that shows love in action. But I want to tell you something. We need to be a church full of unity, full of oneness. Do you know the hallmark of the early church? If you read Acts 1 through 4, you know, I told you to read Ephesians 4 when you get home. That'd be a good. You may want to read Acts 1 through 4 as your bonus. Okay, Acts 1 through 4 is the story of the church. Jesus has already gone to heaven. The church is born in Acts chapter 2, and Acts 2, 3, and 4 really tell the story of the church. Do you know that one of the phrases used over and over again, they were in one mind and in one accord. Now, it doesn't mean they were in a Honda, by the way. Just don't get that. Okay, ha. They were, they were in one mind. Terry said that for you. Okay, they were in one mind, and they were in one accord, which means they had this incredible synergy, this incredible unity. They believed that together is better. Guys, let me tell you something. We need to link arms in this ministry, and we need to walk together through the valleys and through the mountains. We need to walk together because, let me tell you something, I believe more than I've ever believed in my whole life. We, rather than me, is important. We, rather than me. That's why Paul says this, since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other. I belong to you, you belong to me, and each of us needs all the others. I need you, you need me. That is together is better. And then it says in 1 Peter 3, 8, you should be like one big family. You're thinking, you don't know my family. No, that's all right. You should be like one big family full of sympathy toward one another. Do you know what the New Testament model of church is? The New Testament model of church is people connected and guys, that's why we believe together is better. That's why we believe in the importance of fellowship. That's why we believe in the importance of family. That's why on our, our promotional flyer that we give out, our promotional piece, we gave it out in seminary. We have them here. They're, they're our promotional piece we're using right now. It says, church is not a place you go to. Church is a family you belong to. Together is better, Right? What happens when you're going through a tough time? You need some people. Okay? You got God. Yeah, you got prayer, right? But sometimes you need somebody with skin that can hug you, can hold you, can pray with you, can cry with you, can laugh with you when you celebrate. Together is better. You know, I, I got to, you know, I could mention so many stories from our church at this point. Adam and she had just walked through the worst three years of their life, I think, probably with Riley's cancer, and now they're at the end of it, and I just heard your report that he's cancer-free at six months. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a blessing of God? What do you do when you have a three-year-old boy that's diagnosed with cancer? And I think one thing you said to me, Shia, over, this, over the time I've known you, is how much the camaraderie and the connection with the other cancer families helped you through this. And there's 
laughter and tears because sometimes some of those families have lost loved ones that you've been a part of. But you know what? When you walk through the deepest, darkest, worst place in the world, when you're not alone, it makes it easier, right? That's what church is. When you're on the mountaintop and you're celebrating and it's the greatest thing in the world, man, it's great. You're all alone on the mountaintop shouting, hey, this is wonderful. That's really cool. But what if you've got a whole bunch of people celebrating with you, jumping with you? That makes it better. In fact, the old Dutch proverb is this. A shared joy is a double joy. A shared sorrow is half a sorrow. That's togetherness. A shared joy is a double joy. A shared sorrow is half a sorrow. That's why it says we're to shoulder each other's burdens. We're to laugh with those who laugh. We're to weep with those who weep. Why? Because in the New Testament, together is better. That's one of our values. And then the last one, E. Excellence. It honors God and inspires people. You know, I got to tell you, I love, I love the people I serve with at this church. Just before we go out, you don't know the routine, but we meet in the back, all the worship team, and I meet in the back, and we pray, and then we come out here, okay? And every Sunday, this is true, look up here, every Sunday, our worship pastor, John, challenges the worship team and says, listen, we need to go out there and do our best. In fact, this morning, I just it resonates in my ears. You guys that were back there, the worship team, you, John said, listen, our God and our church deserves our best. I love that commitment to excellence. Guys, let me tell you something. When it comes to serving Jesus, good enough is not good enough. Are you with me? We're not supposed to settle for just enough to get by. We're not supposed to settle for just doing the minimum. We need to go all out in extravagance and serve the Lord because excellence honors God and inspires people. That's why this team works so hard. That's why, believe it or not, I put in hours and hours and pour over what I'm going to say to you because I want it to be the best it can be with my skill set, with who I am. I want to give my best. Now, that doesn't mean it's the best in the world. All I want to do is my best in the world, right? Don't get confused that best means that you're going to be the best. All God wants you to do is give your best. And as a church, there's a lot of things we can't do. We don't have the size. We don't have the money. We don't have the personnel. We don't have the volunteers. We not, might not be the best at everything, but we need to be our best. That's what God holds us accountable to. You see, when we go to heaven, he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Good and faithful means you gave your best. Necessarily wasn't the best in the whole world, but you gave your personal best, and that's what mattered. You know, we just got done with the Olympics. Man, I love the Olympics. I love the spirit of the Olympics. I love everything, you know, about that competition. And even the people that didn't win a gold, silver, or bronze, the very fact that they were there and gave their personal best is a huge, huge thing. And so, guys, I'm going to call you. If you're in a ministry, give your best. Don't just phone it in. Don't just do enough to get by. Do you know what? Jesus gave his best on the cross, right? Somebody once said, Jesus is like a Hallmark card. You know what a Hallmark card is when you care enough to send the very best? Jesus is like a Hallmark card. He was God's very best. And you know, when we get to heaven, God's not going to ask you if you were the best. He's going to ask you, did you do your best for me? Jimmy Carter, again, I'm not getting political, one of our presidents was in the Naval Academy, and he had to interview with Admiral Rickover in order to be accepted for the Naval Academy, for the, the officer program in the Naval Academy, and Admiral Rickover was a very intense man, and Jimmy Carter writes about this in his autobiography, and he talks about this interview, and he was a young college guy wanting to go into officer training school in the Naval Academy, and Admiral Rickover asked one question in the interview, one question, one question. Have you done your best? One question. Have you done your best? Looking at his academic records, looking at his transcripts, looking at his letters of recommendation, all that packet that you have to submit. Admiral Rickover, in the interview, asked one question. How intimidating. Have you done your best? Jimmy Carter said he, he lowered his gaze, put his head down, and 
then looked up and, and in a very, very whisper-like voice said, not always. And there was a long pause. And Rick over looked right in Carter's eyes and he said, why not? Why not? What I'm asking you this morning is, have you given your best to honor God through LifePoint Church? Are we giving our best as a church? And I think all of us in honesty and humility would say, not always. And I think Jesus would look at us and say, why not? Why not? And in fact, Carter's autobiography was called Why Not the Best, based on that conversation. Why not? Excellence honors God and inspires people. And just in, th in, in case you think that I'm just kind of making this up, look at what the Bible says. Whatever work you do, do your best. Whatever it is, whatever it is in the church, I'm going to do my best. Why? Because it honors God and inspires people. Okay? Okay? It honors God and as far as people. We're to do our best. Look what this verse says. Work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Enthusiastically. You know the word enthusiasm? Anybody ever heard that word enthusiasm? It's the root word of enthusiastically. That really is based on the Greek in theos. In theos. Enthusiasm. In theos, which means God in. When God is in your life, you ought to be the most enthusiastic, passionate person there is. Do you know that? If you've got Jesus in you, you ought to be so impassioned and so excited and so enthusiastic about doing your best because you've got a Jesus, you've got a Savior, you've got a Lord who did that for you. So the life point statements. All of those ten things that really are at the DNA of our church. All of those things that serve to honor God and to make an impact in the world. Now, I want to end by this. You know, last week I said at the end of the sermon, you'll be in heaven one second and realize it was all worth it. Everything you've done for Jesus, every sacrifice you've made, every amount of money you've given, every time you've invested in service that took up your time and volunteerism, whatever it is, the first second in heaven, you'll know it's worth it. Isn't that great? Today, I want to end by asking you a two-word question. In fact, on the bottom of this back, I want you to write this two-word question down. I want you to write down, what if, dot, dot, dot. To me, what if, those two words are some of the most incredible words in the English language because they're words of potential. They're words of risk. They're words of investment. What if I gave my best to God? What if I was an empowered member? What if I invited everybody that needed a second chance to this church? What if I showed love in action? What if I took an intentional pathway and grew in my faith? What if I really believed and invested in the next generation? What if I committed my life to ongoing discipleship? What if those words are limitless what if we really got serious about our faith in reaching Crowley, Burleson, Southwest Fort Worth for Christ? What if we really decided we're not going to just be selfish and we're going to give our tithe and even give more than that? What if we really got involved in a life group and built relationships? What if we really invested in Bible study and prayer every day? What if we really got in ministry and jumped in with both feet and were enthusiastic? Can you imagine what could happen? Are you with me on this? What if this church really took the truth of God and believed it? What if we stepped out in bold faith? What if we really set some only God can do that goals and trusted God to do something so miraculous that would blow our minds? What if? You see, that is our potential. Now let me tell you something. Most of us change one letter of this, and instead of an F at the end, we put an S. And what is, is often the death of what if. We look at what is, we see what is, we don't think what is can be any more than what it is. How many of you have heard somebody go, what it is is what it is? 
When you put an S at the end of that statement, you kill what God wants to do. What is? What is, is, yeah. Yeah, well, what is? Well, we got a small church. Well, what if we got excited about sharing Jesus? What is? Well, we don't have enough money. What if we got committed to being generous and selfless? What is? Well, we don't have, a, we don't have enough people to serve and volunteer. What if we all got excited and the 80-20, we flipped it on its head instead of 20 people doing everything, that 80% of us or more were all involved and invested? You see, you're going to live your life either a what-is person or a what-if person. We're going to live our lives as a what-is church or a what-if church. It's our choice. Are you ready to go on the what-if adventure? Are you ready to go on the what-if adventure? Let's watch the screen. What if? What if we, the church, all of us, began to live a little dangerous, came out from hiding behind the brush and allowed God to light a flame in us? What if? What if we began a revolution? didn't back down from persecution, became a part of the solution, got in the business of the distribution of love, grace, mercy, that our grips would loosen. What if? What if we knew what God said? Let his word wrap around our hearts and our head, more than words on a page collecting dust unread. Instead, we live like this book is alive and not dead. What if? What if our families were thriving a place of peace, no depriving, no striving, more than just surviving, but rising up to give, serve, invest, care, guide, to set aside our pride, to decide to abide, to stay beside, a place where children confide and where love is supplied and where grace will preside. What if? What if you're 12, 14, 16, 20, and live with a courage unlike many, possess valor, boldness, and faith plenty? Let God write your story from the beginning. Hand him the pen and let him start pinning that all the some days I'll be, they're phony, they're fleeting. You are worthy now and your life has meaning. What if? What if we unleashed compassion, flung our faith into action, opened our homes, our wallets, our hands, our door to the lonely, the outcast, the hurting, the poor, gave to our neighbors and didn't keep score, humbled ourselves so that someone could soar, proclaim the goodness of God like never before. What if? What if our what ifs were more than just words that we say? more than just a game we play what if we didn't stray or sway or live our life in shades of gray what if instead today we prayed god make this our dna i think we'd be dangerous wow that's amazing listen that's our church does that excite you to hear that that we could be a dangerous church most of us are about as dangerous in church as a little pussycat. We need to be lions roaring, not little kitties, okay? K-I-T-T-Y, not little kitties. Listen, we've got a great God. We've got a great God who's got a great plan for this world. We've got a great God who's got a great plan for this world, who lives in us. What does that mean? We've got something to do for God. Man, we need to be a church like that. Man, I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm going to change my what is to a what if. I'm going to stop looking at what is, and I'm going to believe for a what if. Are you with me? I'm going to stop seeing what is and believing for a what if from God. This church can be the greatest church ever known if we get excited about Christ. That's not an egotistical thing. That's a commitment thing. We're going to be our greatest, our best. We're not going to compare ourselves to anybody else, but let's be the best Life Point Church we can be. And it takes a commitment. It takes a commitment. And I want you to do it. I want you to do it. Listen, we're going to pray. And as I pray, I just want you to say, Lord, I want to be a part of the what if. I want to be a part of the what if at Life Point Church. I want you to pray that with me. Father, right now, we just pray. Lord, we pray that we would be a part of the what if mentality. Lord, that we'd be a part of the what if church, that we'd be a part of what if you could work in a way that we never thought possible. God, we want to be a part of the what if. Forgive us, God. Forgive us for what is mentality that's kept us 
in mediocrity. Lord, forgive us for a what is mentality that's kept us from believing for bigger things. Lord, forgive us for a what is mentality that's kept us down and discouraged and defeated. Lord, help us to see that we truly can soar because you're a great God with great potential for us. Lord, today, we want to be a what if church. We want to do it to honor you in Christ's name.